Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 770th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Susan B. and Anne McCoy. We're also thrilled to welcome poet Charles Bernstein here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Brooklyn-based artist Susan B. has had 10 solo shows at AIR Gallery. B. has published 18 artists' books, including collaborations with Susan Howe, Charles Bernstein, and Rachel Levitsky, among others. B.'s artwork is in many collections and has been widely reviewed. She has given numerous talks in museums and galleries in the U.S. and abroad, and her latest book is Off World Fairy Press. Uh, fairy tales with uh, Johanna Drucker and is it is now out from Litmus Press. And New York-based sculptor, painter, and art critic Anne McCoy is an editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. She lectured at the Yale School of Drama for 10 years and taught in the art history department at Barnard College for 20 years. Anne's work is included in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, LACMA, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, MoMA, SF MoMA, and elsewhere. And in 2019, she was awarded a John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. And it is with great pleasure that I pass it over to Anne to begin this conversation. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, before I launch into our tribute to Susan B., I want to uh, say that I think that because it's Women's History Month, <clears throat> Uh, I wanted to, first of all, acknowledge the amazing 30-year contribution that Mira Shore and Susan B. made to the world of, of women artists. Uh, there, one of the problems that women artists have always had is that we really have had, we, we really didn't have a voice. And one of the first uh, journals to really give women artists a voice was Heresies. And Susan and Mira sort of were in the next generation down and were inspired by heresies, but they made, I, I think, what was one of the great contributions to the art world, especially for women like me. I was, I actually, the first writing I did really, the first publishing I really did was a something for Meeting Magazine. And so that they were, they mentored people, they encouraged women, and it wasn't just women. I mean, they threw in the odd man, uh, and it was mostly artists writing with poets, book reviews. And um, then, uh, then they actually, it started as a, uh, uh, then it started as a book in print and then it went online in 2000. And then in 2000, the Duke, Uni I'm sorry, it went online. Then in 2000, the book, uh, a book was published with the Duke University Press. So this is the book. So I now I we can, we can go back to the, we can you can phase out of that. There we go. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to just give a brief introduction to Susan's work. Um, I have I I have known about the work for a long time through by seeing her exhibitions at AIR. Uh, I think one of the first piece I the first piece I wrote about Susan's work was in a Jewish publication called The Forward, and uh, I it was a, an article about the space in her work. And then the next time I really uh, did something with her work was in the 2014 critics page for the Brooklyn Rail on the unconscious. And we ran a full page uh, reproduction of, I think one of my all time favorite paintings ever by any artist. And it was called The Lost Doll that Susan did. And it was so spectacular. I said, "Run!" We, I talked them into running a full page. It was worth it. Um, I want to, I, a lot has been written about Susan's work and I, I've been thinking about it a lot and I wanted to say something that I think hasn't been said or maybe not in the same way. 
And that is, Susan is, has an interesting background. Her family comes, her parents both come from a long line of a Torah scribes. I'm not sure of the proper name, but, and her parents were both illustrators and graphic artists. And I mean, we, we all know her mother, Miriam uh, offers work, which was incredible, but she also was an illustrator. And uh, I, Susan was telling me a wonderful story that her mother was illustrating a children's book and that Susan, had, the illustration was out on the table and Susan as a child crawled up on the table and decided it just needed a little something extra and did a bit of painting on it, which I thought was absolutely wonderful. But I, I've thought a lot about Susan's work. And Susan and I, Susan has a large collection of children's books. And Susan and I also grew up in an era when children's books were quite different. Uh, most of my children's books came from my mother, so they were hers. They were really even older. And as a child, I loved being able to sort of sink into a, a children's book where, you know, little people lived among the foxgloves and wore little hats made of, you know, blue bonnet flowers and things like that. And it was a wonderful world of fantasy and, and kind of innocence and fantasy that, and it was, and an enchantment. I think enchantment is a word that we don't have in the art world. I, I'm sure they don't teach the concept of enchantment in the Whitney program. You know, even children's books now have a pedagogical thing where there has to be kind of almost like a moral as a message, you know, about the environment or, uh, you know, new family structures or what gender, whatever. And um, that the, I think that uh, children are missing something. And Susan and I were both also very interested in fairy tales and in the positive transformation uh, the, the the positive side of fairy tales. I mean, not quite as grim as grim. I guess I want to uh, maybe break in here. Um, I'm really thrilled that, to be talking with Anne, and I really want to um, also thank the rail for our support over the many, many years that Fong has started the rail and has been so supportive of, of all women artists and also of meaning and also of AIR, which is having its 51st anniversary this year. Um, so I, I think that um, beyond the fact of the fairy tale, it's amazing that um, a feminist space like AIR can still exist. Um, that's kind of a fairy tale situation right there. Um, and also, I, I you know, Coming out of a family of artisans and artists, going back to my great grandfather, who was a Torah scribe, um, I think you know we're we're going to discuss the question of why so much of my content is based on medieval illumination. But my parents always did make illuminated manuscripts, and when I'm working on these kind of illuminations, I always feel very in sync with the world somehow. So that's something I wanted to add to Anne's introduction. And uh, that's interest in fantasy and dreams and demons and um, mythological um, aspects of what we're doing. Uh, I, there was, there's something else. And that is that I think that uh, it's interesting, the idea of the medieval imagination versus kind of the Renaissance imagination, because it's it in the medieval world you see bestiaries and things like that where they didn't really know what a giraffe looked like or or some of these animals looked like so they would sort of make them up and there's an incredible charm to this and they, this the way they sort of combined images was also interesting and I think that that and also in the medieval imagination you feel like you there you kind of walked into the image and there was another world which was kind of the imaginal world. It wasn't quite the real world. It's it's not, it doesn't look quite like the real world. And I think that with Susan's art, what fascinates me is there is an incredible charm. There's an incredible way that you walk through the picture plane into this kind of imaginary space. And also uh, the, in, the in, her, her take on the images and how, they differ from the original manuscript. So I think that, um, and the, the utter, ch that's the charm. 
you know, when I'm, whenever I'm depressed, I give Susan a call because I think that, or, or, or a studio visit at Susan's studio is sort of like a trip to the Enchanted Elf Cottage studio. You know, it's a wonderful experience. And I think that it's important in the art world to recognize that that is kind of a unique space. I mean, you have people like Amy Cutler, you know, it's kind of very edgy take on fairy tales, but I don't know anyone who's doing exactly what Susan B does. And I think that in this horrible world, it's wonderful that we have someone who allow who allows us to enter that space. And also there's a very kind of feminine perspective too of, you know, the, 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 the monsters are tamed, you know, on a leash and by sprinkling holy water or flowers and, you know, kind of making friends with them. And this is a very feminine way. It relates to, you know, the kind of energy celebrated by Aphrodite of positive human relationships and real eros. I guess I would, I would add that, you know, I'm really interested in kind of um, making the monsters appealing. And I found that in the medieval manuscript, so this one, the, the first three that we're seeing are part of an apocalypse series that is based on a manuscript from the Morgan Library. And Why don't we just launch into this apocalypse series and I'll let Susan talk. Here we go. Oh, oh, well, I'm, we just went through a few of the images and it's all, um, they're all oil paintings actually. Um, so they're very different from the manuscript illustration illuminations, which are very small. And uh, these paintings are 30 by 24. Could but, we go back to Apoly Apocalypse 1, 2, and 3 just real fast? And then, yeah, there we okay, go. So that's number one. So I, when I started the first one, I didn't quite realize I was going to be making a series. Um, I, I was so intrigued by seeing the manuscript. Um, I love the Morgan Library because it's like a source for everything medieval. And, um, and I'd also gone to India. So the, the green and yellow um, in the first one, the green and yellow uh, kind of Hunaman uh, character on the left is sort of Indian, which is certainly not what the, you know, the medieval illuminators of France were actually thinking of. But I love, I also love the kind of um, glee that the monsters um, have, you know, they're always really happy to be causing problems. And since this was painted during the pandemic and during, partially during the Trump years, I just felt like it was so relevant to have a kind of, to have a way of depicting evil and um, also demons and people causing trouble in the world. So that's what I was thinking of when I made these paintings. So we could look at the next one, um, which is number two. So they, they, they came as a series, and in each one I found slightly different um, ways of depicting the apocalypse, also adding arrows. And I took, um, as I told Anne, I, I took all the crosses out of the hands of the saints and put in flowers. So to make it a little less um, religious <laughs> and also to, uh, and, and sort of made up the backgrounds. So that's Apocalypse 2, and then we can go to 3. Um, and here we see also one of the jolly demons and the poor praying people on the left, which I, in the illumination, they're very, they're not really differentiated from each other, but in my version, I like to have them each have a personality. Like, you know, each person is from a different background. Um, and I really thought about, who these people were who were being demonized or who were praying for their lives, really. Um, and then I guess in the next one, the final one, um, this, is, this is number four. And by this time I had kind of wanting to make a bigger picture. It's the same size, but I feel like I got more of the um, backdrop and, you know, the, they are kind of thickly painted oil paintings. So part of it is the oil painting and the joy of doing color and fantasy. And the other part is making, a, making an image that is, you know, enjoyable to look at and also kind of 
makes you question like where is the demons you know standing um and also i was referring to the manuscript which is the next slide um so this is actually what i was using for my template so to speak and i started by looking at these manuscripts and making drawings from them and then from the drawings i went to the um paintings and um, so it was uh, very, very compelling to work with this um, material. Um, I guess the next one we're going to talk about is um, St. Martha and the Terrasec. So before I started this series, I started to do a series of saints. Um, I was thinking about how, uh, how to tame demons and how, how to um, how the saints were very strong women who were able to like take this demonic um, Tara Sek, who's sort of a dragon fish and tame the, uh, put it on a leash, sprinkle it with holy water and um, tame it. And um, maybe Anne wants to say something about that. You were, you were, it's funny. I mean, it's funny. I was just telling Susan, there's an, I, I'm reviewing it right now. If I ever get the review written, there's a huge exhibition at Asia Society on it, visions of hell from Buddhist, Jain, Hindu, et cetera, manuscripts. And it's so, it's so wonderful to compare these two exhibitions. I loved your story about the terror sect where you said that in the town, they still have a festival for this where they, they have like a, a, a big puppet or something. I love that story. Yeah, so what the story is that um, in the, it's from France, the so South France, and in it, the town of Tarascon, which is I think actually a city, is actually named after this beast, which is the Tarasek. And they celebrate the taming of the Tarasek every year. So they have a festival where they parade this um, creature um, in effigy <laughs> down the main street of, of Tarascon. And um, so what happened was I ran across this image, I can't quite remember how, and then I started to see more of these images and I ended up doing a series. Um, I tend to work in series. And um, so the next one we can see. So in this one, St. Martha, is um, riding on top of the dragon and she's pointing, you know, pointing the way. So I called it St. Martha Shows the Way. And then the arrows were something that I added as sort of a, a directional advice, <laughs> some kind of directional abstract um, a device. I mean, for many years I was an abstract painter. So figuration is always somewhat abstract to me also. Um, and a lot of it is really about painting the clouds, like how am I going to paint the dragon? How am I going to give the sense that she's riding in the air? Um, so I, I really like to make these things as lively as possible. Um, next. Um, so this one is St. Martha on the rocks. And one thing I was looking at these um, medieval manuscripts, which feature St. Martha. And often, the, the, as you can see in this picture, the creature has, um, has swallowed a man <laughs> and the feet are sticking out. At first, I couldn't figure out what it was because I had a really bad reproduction of the, um, of the manuscript. And I thought it was teeth. And then I realized they were legs sticking out. So. There's actually something humorous, I think, about this image that I really wanted to, to kind of address. I love the way you depict saints because I mean, as, as a Catholic girl who had a, a hagiography, you know, like as a child, I, I always thought of the poor saints with their eyes getting, you know, gouged out or some martyrdom. And I love the way your wonderfully positive depiction of them even the saints are cheery. I think it's, I, I love this kind of wonderful feminine energy. Yeah, I, I think of the saints as um, 
not so much as martyrs, but as her heroines. And I feel like this saint who, um, you know, tamed this beast, who's a dragon, is very powerful, but also has a somewhat um, childlike quality to her relation to the to the beast. You know, it's almost like she's walking a dog. So, and I had a dog as a child, so I guess I was kind of thinking of of our relationship to animals also and to beasts and also to evil and to demons and how you know because in a way for me some of the some of the ecological nightmares and political nightmares and military nightmares that we've been going to through um how do you how do you deal with that and uh in terms of imagery and i think that's what this kind of imagery is pointing to. So next. Um, so here we have Saint Martha at the cave. And you can see she's she's holding on to the um, dragon and she's got it on a leash, but the dragon has swallowed a person again. And once again, is depicted with these uh, legs coming out, which I just found hysterical. I think these, Paintings are somewhat humorous, you know. I don't I don't know how everybody sees it, but there's something cartoon-like and funny about some of the imagery. Um, and then of course the man is the one spearing, spearing the beast. Um, it's interesting because the dragon is also a dual symbol, especially like in alchemical literature. The dragon can be a horrific beast, but it can also be a symbol of the prima materia. So it, it's interesting to me that you make these them so friendly in a way, or they can be tamed in a way, because I think psychologically that's an important fact, it, especially when you understand psychological symbolism as it relates to alchemical literature. I'd love this. I love this sort of the feminine approach, the holy water and the leash, as opposed to the masculine approach of let's stick a spear in it. it this is one of <laughs> Yeah, I think that's kind of a funny division in this one, because in this one, we have the woman who seems very calm, and she's got, you know, she seems to have the whole thing under control. And then we have the man who's like, putting the spear in. So I found it very um, interesting as an image, and also the cave that he's coming out of. Um, so it, I, I went online to search for images of this particular um, saint and this particular dragon. Um, but then I moved on in the next one to, um, uh, this is a different saint. Um, so this is Saint Margaret and the dragon. And in this story, she actually was swallowed by this dragon and then she cut her way out and killed the dragon and then she's been imprisoned and this whole scene became very interesting to me as i was working on it and she she's very pure in her coloration but um the background became very animated uh the background of the wall that she was imprisoned in which at first i painted just one color i was trying for a very bland look which I hardly ever managed to pull off. Um, but then I got really interested in the idea of animating the wall. So um, there's eyes and mouths and um, it's also, there's a little window where she's imprisoned and she's praying. Um, so the whole composition took on a different meaning for me when I started to reanimate the wall. Also, like in mythology, when someone cuts their way out of a Leviathan, I mean, even Jonah and the whale, Vishnu, oh. when they cut their way out, they they emerge transformed in some way. Uh, you know, Jonah limps and loses his hair, I think, and limps. But it's interesting that you've got this. That I love this dragon with his tongue out. He's so sweet. <laughs> but then you've got that. Then she, you know, she's she's kind of regained her a new life of, with a kind of purity. And the, the wonderful stained glass behind, I mean, I think that the space and the backgrounds, I think that this particular image was one of my favorites in the show. I think it, it's so multidimensional. It's, it's absolutely fabulous. Yeah, it's a pretty small painting too. 
So the detail is is more, um, you know, it's a, I, I'm working very small in some of these works in, but the subject is kind of big to me. Um, you know, it's funny because I'm thinking more along the lines of a manuscript, which would be a small illustration in a book. So when I make these paintings, even though they're a series, they're often very small. Um, so we could go to the next one. So this one, well, Purgus Knight, the other sub theme of my, uh, my, my thoughts in the last three, these are basically paintings from the last three years, which is when I had my last show. Um, I was really reading a lot about uh, witches and how they were, you know, Sylvia Federici's book about witches and how women were, you know, burnt at the stake and all these terrible things that happened to women in the Middle Ages and since. But um, this is based on one of her illustrations. So um, I was really interested in making this an animated, animating of what it is uh, based on, which is a black and white woodcut and sort of a fantastic scene. So what I really enjoyed was also making the little creatures that are spitting fire above their heads. And yet I thought, even though it's kind of a dire possibly scene, it ended up being quite comic. Um, and so I think there's always an underlayer of kind of laughter or comedy in some of these um, scenes. Absolutely. I mean, instead of horrified children being given over to the witch, they become these dolls. I mean, it's it's a kind of wonderful transformation. Yeah, and I was, I like the idea of um, taking something that could be very, in the original woodcut, which is actually from the trial of um, Agnes Sampson in 1591. So in fact, it was kind of a reportage of a witch trial. But what I was interested in was how this was depicted and how we could change the depiction and update it. And um, so the devil in the middle is actually seems quite friendly and in a good mood. Um, so that was my kind of alteration of the story. Um, next. Um, this is another one, uh, which way? which I was, which, another witch. Um, I'm very interested in the stories of witches. Um, a number of my friends are also working on images of witches um, because they are very powerful. And I like the idea of the broomstick carrying the witch away. Um, above... You've always loved early Chagall. And I think that, the, the Chagall, you know, with his flying cows and things like that, also has this wonderful idea of sort of ant animating the heavens, you know, where things can kind of take off into the into the clouds. I think it's a fabulous little work. Yeah, and I, I it also gives me a, an opportunity to to paint like sky and clouds, and you know, Part of it is the joy of the painting um, and the depiction and how you can change a painting uh, to make it animated and make it lively. Um, so next. Um, so this one is also in the show and uh, this one is called Heartwing from 2020. Um, and I made a series of three paintings based on uh, manuscript illustrations for uh, the Petite Livre d'Amour from, from 1500. Um, it's a collection of love poems written by Pierre Sala. And I came across this image and I just loved it during the pandemic, uh, sort of the heart of the pandemic when I was at, very isolated at home and uh, sort of stuck in my studio painting. And these, these flying hearts that the women are catching in their net and then some of them land on the ground and are, um, they seem to be dead or, or, you know, injured. I just, it to me, it brought a lot of my feelings during the pandemic to life. 
Plus it was written by and illustrated by um, Pierre Sala for his lover. And so it's a very to me, literally heartwarming um, piece. And um, there's the two more, which I'll show you next. I, I think it's also, I mean, this wonderful thing about the courtly love tradition is that it, it's, it's a kind of chaste and tender celebration of love, which is something that is certainly lacking in our era. You know, the, the, this, where he's placing the heart, the heart in the flower. I mean, this is a wonderful image and I'm, I'm glad, it's wonderful to think about courtly love again in this way. I, I think it's a great, another great depiction of a kind of positive eros. Go ahead. Yes, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, I was very charmed by these illustrations and, um, from what I can make out, the book is in the British Library, so I just saw it online. But it's they're they're very small, you know. It's a very small little book, and it's very personal, which not all of the manuscripts are. Um, let's see the next one. Um, this one was the most mysterious of all to me, and I really enjoyed making a painting out of it. Um, I call it shadow play. And he appears to be, that is, um, I believe, the protagonist, who's also the person who put this book together. And he seems to be cutting the branch and then about to fall into the water. And then his shadow is below him. And all of these things are somewhat in the original <laughs> uh, manuscript, but the whole thing became more and more mythic as I looked at it. Um, as I examined the, the image, you know, I just thought, well, this is very strange because he's above the water and yet he's in the water. And the ax became very important to me, um, you know, that he was, that he was going to cut himself loose somehow. Um, so I get very caught up in the stories as I'm painting them. Sometimes uh, the stories become very alive. Um, and I start to think about what is what what was behind uh, what is behind this story. Um, so I'd say that in terms of my work, there's always a, a narrative, which of course I'm not always there to tell a person what the narrative is, but I'm assuming the viewer will make you know will make their own story out of these. Um, so it's funny, I had a discussion with William Kentridge about narrative because I and you know, we were saying how important it is the reintroduction of narrative back into the art, you know, with with things like, you know, the, the formalists and the abstract expressions. This was a part of, of, you know, that was kind of pushed aside. And it's wonderful that people like you and Lenore Carrington have brought this back into the discussion. I, I love that aspect. Yeah, well, as I said, I, I was for many years an abstract painter. And when I started, I sort of had a craving to go back to figuration and to stories and to narratives. So now I'm kind of looking to find images that, that appeal to me. And um, here is, this one's called Duet, which um, is based on a Romanesque cover to a chest. And I love, the, the relation between the two women who are, you know, in two different color schemes. And it, to me, it's really about the friendship between women and the importance of that friendship. And then I really enjoyed making, making their, um, you know, creating a space for them to be together. But it's also very, very decorative. Um, I, I don't like to get rid of the decoration. Um, I think this was, you know, partially a reaction to studying with minimalists. <laughs> it didn't take. So uh, in many ways, these are maximalist um, paintings, I would say. Um, next. Uh, this one is uh, Galatia. And here I was looking at um, more mythic images. Um, and also I was interested in um, the Cyclops and how he's viewing the woman. So the woman seems very vulnerable and the Cyclops is kind of like staring her down. But part of the joy of making this painting was actually 
creating the landscape around the Cyclops and around Galatia. Could you mention, I mean, while we're on this image, briefly, you're interested in uh, Gustave Moreau. Yeah, so I went to Gustave Moreau's house in um, Paris, and I had actually never really understood the power of his symbolism and also the power of narrative that he brings to everything. And, um, you know, it's very turn of the century and it's not, you know, his, his background is certainly not my background, <laughs> you know, but, but I do appreciate it. And, and I think he really brought something of the mythos of the past into, uh, into the turn of the century, almost Art Nouveau, um, you know, space. And this is really fascinating to me as an artist um, and also how he depicts the women. They're actually very interestingly painted. And so I, I've learned a lot from looking at the symbolists and the romantic painters, you know, Caspar David Friedrich also. Um, and their, their feeling for, um, for landscape and well, it'll come up a little bit later. I guess we should move on to the next one. But um, you know, I've been I've been looking at a lot of different types of symbolism in my work and sort of trying to create a vocabulary of flowers and eyes and in this one, enigma variations. Uh, the female figure is from the Brooklyn Museum from three thousand five hundred BC. Um, an Egyptian figure. So I, I want to bring bits of the past into my into my viewing and into our viewing, um, but make it new, you know. So that that's kind of my mission at the moment. Um, so next, this one um, unfortunately didn't make it into the show because I had too much work as always. But um, this one was painted during the heart of the pandemic when I just dreamt of meeting my friends in the, in the woods and even seeing friends. And so in uh, here we were dressed in kind of a 19th century garb uh, based on a Winslow Homer painting that I had seen it in Spain before the pandemic. And uh, I just liked the idea that I would meet my friends so in a way, these are all, I, I hate to say that they're all self-portraits, but since I feel like my, my being as a painter is inside the paintings, um, I would say in that sense, they're self-portraits also. Um, so I'll go to the next one. Uh, I've been doing this series, um, now, so after the pandemic kind of lifted a bit and I got out to the countryside, uh, I started to decide to paint trees. And this is the largest painting in the show. Uh, it's currently up at AIR. And it um, doesn't have any sources. This is just based on a drawing I did looking out the window. And also it's, uh, it's a melange of all of the or maybe I could say an accumulation of all the symbols that I've put in all my previous works. Um, you know, I've been, this is my 10th solo show and I've accumulated a lot of uh, imagery that, you know, sailboats, bo bees, birds, bugs, snakes, you know, nests, um, butterflies, arrows. I, this is kind of, I was, this is a, an accumulative work, I would say, where the tree is um, stands in almost for a person who is holding all these symbols. I was thinking of mythology too, because I, I mean, if you know, Hilma of Clint actually painted images from it, but if you know Norse mythology, you know, there's this world tree with different layers where kind of universes and whole life forms can exist in these different layers on the tree. And, this amazing, really powerful symbol of the tree of life. I, I think the, these are fabulous. 
Yeah, I, I was thinking a lot of um, Trees of Life and, and and I had a show, I guess about in 2006 called Philosophical Trees. And it was, um, and I'm now kind of harking back to that because I was thinking a lot of the tree of life as a symbol and um, the importance of trees in our life, um, the importance of nests, um, all of these things came to me and also the, you know, there's a path that leads up to the tree and then the tree, you can go into the tree. So the tree becomes a house also. Um, and I think in both of my studios here in Brooklyn and also upstate, I face a lot of trees and the trees are truly inspirational and, I, and the changes that they go through during the year. I mean, it's, it's a great comfort to look at the trees. So um, I guess we'll go to the next one. Um, so then this just came to me. I did a drawing and I was thinking of Alice in Wonderland. And um, I looked at a lot of illustrations for Alice in Wonderland, the original illustrations um, from the turn of the century. But here I just, um, was inspired to think about an, another animated tree and landscape. Um, and next, and this is another one called Birdland, which is also in the current show. Uh, it's mid-size, like 30 by 40. And uh, once again, I have all these symbols and the tree is animated in a way it comes to life. So it's, they're certainly not realistic trees. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's more of a, a way of enchanting the trees, or I think of them as enchanted trees, you know, trees that have come alive um, in a different way and hold different um, symbols in them. Um, next. Um, here, Definitely an ode to Chagall here. <laughs> this is an ode, yes. Yeah, exactly. This is an ode to Chagall. Um, you know, as far as Jewish painters, uh, he's very important. And um, this was one of, based on something he painted in 1911, which was Poet Under the Trees, which of course totally spoke to me since, um, you know, I'm married to a poet. My friends are all poets. My collectors are poets. Um, and so, and poets under a tree is like where I want to be. So um, I love this portrait of a poet under the tree. So I did a, did a um, version of it, but my version is just filled with birds. Um, I'm very inspired by Chagall, although late Chagall, I can't say I totally love, but I've learned a lot from looking at his work. Um, next. Uh, this is a painting I did based on uh, a drawing by, um, by Enzor, uh, by Munk rather, not Enzor. I'm thinking Enzor, but I'm, Enzor and Munk are, are combined in my mind. Um, Death and the Maiden. And um, Ed, Munk is like my, you know, a god to me. <laughs> Everything he did just, you know, his, his Nordic noir feeling really is, is it permeates a, a lot of my thinking. So this is an homage to his way of viewing the world because he always has these gorgeous young women who are, you know, very caught up in uh, dealing with death. And so this was my homage to, to him. Uh, next. Uh, brush strokes. This is another Chagall takeoff. I have to say that it's a takeoff because I was looking at a Chagall um, painting from 1943, which is called The Kiss. And um, I substituted myself and uh, my husband Charles for the, the protagonists. And one of the things I just totally love about this painting is the walking lamppost that you can kind of see um, walking along the path up there. 
So it, it really is an homage to Chagall. And it's interesting to me that he painted it in the middle of World War II. And yet there is something, there's something very powerful about the, the painter figure um, who I changed to a woman, but she's holding the brushes and merging with the other figure. And that, that became really interesting to me also as an image. Um, and then I'm gonna finish up here uh, with another image. Uh, this was uh, demonology from my last show and it's in the collection of Fong, our Fong Bui. And um, it was also on the cover of the April 2020 rail, which um, was, <laughs> came out eventually in September, 2020. It was the heart of the pandemic. Um, so this was the main uh, painting in the show that was postponed for six months and happened in September, 2020. And here um, I inserted my own portrait uh, instead of Enzor. So Enzor in, is um, the protagonist, but uh, instead I, instead of Enzor, his self-portrait um, I put in my own self-portrait at an, uh, not at the current age, by the way, at an earlier age. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's sort of the way I used to look when I had brown hair, you know. So um, that was sort of, I, I've been doing that again and again. And here is uh, actually behind me is one of the, the other uh, paintings along these lines. It's the next one, yeah. Um, that's Masquerade. And here I also inserted my self-portrait instead of Enzor. Um, and I was really, it was painted during the heart of the pandemic. So it's all about masks and masking. And I started to look at a lot of African masks and Mexican masks and, uh, you know, different masks for reference. Um, so it became really about masking, but what's so interesting to me about Enzor is that he lived above a mask store. <laughs> so he was, he was really obsessed with masks. And during the pandemic, we were all masked. So um, I ended up calling this painting Masquerade. And uh, that's the last of the paintings I'm gonna show. This is the cover. Um, the other aspect of my work, which I don't have real time to go into right now, is um, many, many books, but you can find them on my website. Um, this is my latest book. I've done three books with the artist, designer, and all around critic, Johanna Drucker. And this is the last one that we did together that came out in 2020. And it's all fairy tales that she wrote. And then I did the illustrations and also the, the design that we did together. So um, I've been doing a lot of collaborations with poets and a lot of my work is book work, in fact. So I wanted to just, um, and this one is available through Litmus. There's also the next slide is the, um, this is actually one of the illustrations that I did to one of her stories uh, that's in the book. So she had sci-fi fairy tales and she sent them to me and I made pictures for them or vice versa, I made pictures and then she wrote a story for it. But I find working with other people on collaborations has been one of the best things that I do as an artist. Um, I love working with poets and I love um, collaborating. And I also do a lot of book covers for, I've done about 50 book covers. So that's the next thing. Um, the next slide is the topsy-turvy cover, which is um, Charles Bernstein's latest book. And that's my, um, painting of kind of me looking at somebody upside down. <laughs> I did the painting, strangely enough, the painting existed before the book 
was named Topsy Turvy and I named the painting Topsy Turvy. So uh, it was very much in sync. And uh, so- Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for, for interrogate, your interreg, your questions. <laughs> let's, your, let's put it that way. Um, I hope this leads to Charles. Um, we actually have a bunch of amazing Yeah, we have a Q&A. Oh, <laughs> well, we have the Q&A yes. first. Oh, oh, okay. I Hold their horses. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, now I, now I get it. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Susan. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Anne. That was so amazing. I was just thinking that it's very, feels very appropriate for spring equinox, which is today. So thank you so much again, Susan. Um, we've got a lot of amazing questions today. And the first one is going to be um, from TOS. So you should be able to unmute in just a moment. Um, sorry, just, well, maybe I'll just read it. Um, you should be able to unmute now, if not. Hi, shall I just go ahead and ask? Please, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I was wondering, is Susan, or Susan, are you cognizant of the dragon and what it is in pre-Judeo-Christian European culture, namely the cosmic life force? And further, um, is Susan cognizant that the dragon in Christian culture and iconography actually represents inculcated fear of an institutionalized war against and destruction of the old European culture or old Europe as Maria Gimbutas has called it? Thank you, that's my question. Well, I take that to be more of a statement. Um, you know, I have my own feelings about dragons, but um, of course I respect all the possible symbolic. I mean, the dragon is such a strong symbol of many, in many cultures, not just in European culture, but I'm sure in the Hell Show, which I haven't seen yet, that in Asian cultures and also in, um, when I was in India, there's always these demonic, dragons and I'm very happy to have your interpretation added to mine. Thank you so much, Susan. That was great. Um, we have another question from Ruth and Ruth, you should be able to unmute and ask. Hi, Susan. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> now I'm thinking of 20 more questions, but I'll try to stick to to one about alchemy and the symbolism of alchemy, because I read somewhere that um, Jung said that alchemy, the symbols in alchemy are universal to the culture and not related to the individual's dream. And do you think of them that way? Um, I'm not the Yugi and expert here. Actually, that's Anne. <laughs> is this an Anne question? I think this is an Anne question. Because <laughs> um, oh, I studied Anne's alchemy for a Anne has studied the Jungian uh, perspective. And frankly, I'm kind of a newbie to it. Mm -hmm. I, I lecture on alchemy. And, and it, actually, if you read Jung, he has probably 60 different references to the dragon. So it's never exactly that cut and dried. And in different alchemical texts, as I said, it can it can represent a, a variety of things. The thing about Jungian symbolism and alchemical symbolism is that you can't approach it in, in a kind of cookbook way. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have you have many depictions of the slaying of the dragon in alchemy. OK, well, can I ask one more thing? Yeah. Do we ever get to see your abstract paintings? Oh, oh, you're asking me. Um, well, you know, I, ha I haven't really had a retrospective uh, yet. So 
at some point, I should really show some of the earlier abstract paintings, but um, the abstract photograms that I did were actually shown at South First Gallery. So I have shown some of that early work, but um, it was around 1981 that I stopped doing the abstract painting. So everything since then has had some level of figuration. But uh, when I did the abstract paintings, it, it, they were mostly triangles. There were a lot of shaped canvases and triangles and um, also a bit of minimalism since I was studying with minimalists. I actually learned how to paint in two colors for several years. It was quite a <laughs> deal for me. You know? they, they, my teachers really hated the fact that I used so many colors. You know? that, that was that was really what they disliked most about my work. So I bet the minimalists weren't too big on all those little fairies and things either. They quite oh, didn't quite know what. It... <laughs> If I had been doing that work, I probably would have been thrown out of, uh, you know, the program. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, this the, this work that I'm doing now would never have been possible. But this was the '70s, for one thing. So um, that's another Thanks. story. <laughs> thank you, Ruth, for that question, and thank you so much, Susan and Anne. Um, our next question is going to be from GE. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Susan. Hi, Hi Anne. And thank you, Eleanor. Um, uh, looking so much at these today, I kept thinking of the silly Kathinsky, um, especially a series he did on, on small pleasures, which is really uh, a series of connected apocalyptic, or as we would call a book of revelation paintings that were based on, um, pretty much on popular folk depictions of various Christian myths and stuff like that at the time and uh, from the Book of Revelations and Apocalypse. And, um, and it was his way of dealing with the good and evil of his time. Uh, is, is this sort of, is there anything in alignment with what you're doing here? Who did you say though? I missed the, I missed Kandinsky. The, oh, Kandinsky. Kandinsky. Let's study Kandinsky. Oh, I, well, I love Kandinsky. And yeah. also, I'm really inspired by folk art. Um, I actually gave a little talk about Morris Hirschfield and outsider art. Um, I'm very, very interested in um, those kinds of depictions, um, Pennsylvania Dutch depictions, outsider art, quilts. Um, all of those things are really, those directions are super um, exciting to me. And I think Kandinsky, when you look at the early Kandinsky, it's clear he's coming out of um, out of sort of Russian um, folk art and and also stained glass. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Kandinsky. He's been an inspiration, you know, since I was little, because I grew up not that far from the Guggenheim Museum, I always saw a lot of Kandinsky. And everything that he did from the start where he was so expressionistic and abstract and to the end when he made the, you know, the more geometric work um, is just like one of my, and of course the Blauer Reiter movement and his writing and his poetry, which I used to teach in my class on artists writing at SVA is, is you know, just, incredible you know so from i really wish i could have met kandinsky <laughs> that, that, that would be a great person to meet in person you know so thank you for bringing him up sure thank you thank you ge that was a great question um our next question will be from john should be able to unmute okay uh can you hear me now yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Susan, the work is marvelous. Uh, my question really was triggered by the Apocalypse series. Uh, the, you know, your flat color, the bright color, the heavy lines, uh, for me are a kind of desublimation of these very psychologically laden themes like the apocalypse. And I, as for me, it's a kind of ribbing of the Jungian. And I wonder, uh, uh, you know, uh, for me, this also connects perhaps to the language poets, a kind of desublimating uh, 
quality to their work. And I wonder if, if you feel this is true and this is maybe what you, uh, how you sympathize with the uh, language school of poetry. Well, I'm very deeply sympathetic with the language school. Of <laughs> I'm married to one of, and I designed the magazine language. Yes. So that should give me a, a lot of insight into the language school. Plus I wrote for the magazine. I wrote yes. about Mahal Naji and I wrote about photograms and I wrote about Ed Ruscha. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've learned so much from studying how the poets approach their, you know, their poems um, in the language school and elsewhere in terms of symbolism and also cut up, the use of cut ups, the use of um, the kind of imagery. And I guess in the Apocalypse series, I wouldn't know exactly how it relates to language poetry per se, but I think the use of imagery and taking apart the imagery. So each, you know, I sort of paint them in sections. And um, so it's it's a it's a made-up landscape in a way. And I think that fantasy of the made-up landscape is also connected to a poet's way of putting together images. Well, can I ask, do you think that combination of flatness and brightness? with a certain amount of uh, unsubtlety uh, of line is characteristic of the language poets as well. Um, I don't know, we can ask Charles later. When he <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, I think, uh, you know, some of them are more subtle than others. So I, I don't wanna accuse them of not being subtle. I am not subtle, but um, <laughs> they may be more subtle than I am, you know, because also when you're using words, it's such a different thing. Um, I'm so enamored of um, color and of pattern and of texture. Oh, wait, there's Charles. Maybe he can answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's directed to him. Um, but uh, no, I, I totally admire the poets and how they manage to make uh, language come alive. And uh, I just have my little toolbox of brushes. <laughs> That's a great toolbox. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, our next question I will be asking on behalf of Maria. Maria wrote in the chat, if possible, can you connect some dots between folk art slash folk poetry and language poetry? Hmm. That's a tall order. <laughs> um, folk poetry. I don't, I can't say that I'm really an expert in that field. I can connect the dots between somebody like Morris Hirschfield and his very, um, but you can check out my talk that I gave for the Folk Art Museum. It's actually online. Um, but Anne, do you wanna add something to that? No, I, can't, I, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, I, I, well, it, something about the folk art approach um, and the directness is what I admire in uh, Morris Hirschfeld and in a lot of the folk artists um, and the outsider artists. And also there's, there's a kind of like joy and charm even in the grimmest pictures often. And that's something I sort of picked up on in, ter in, in my work. Um, in terms of poetry, I feel like I shouldn't be answering that question. <laughs> I mean, I was, I'm, I'm a relative of poets, but I'm not a poet myself, so I, I don't like to speak for the poetry community. Um, well, thank you so much. I was um, thinking in terms of sort of the, the, the escape, in hard times, I was thinking that it's so necessary sometimes to be able to have this sort of escape into a more joyful fantasy. I was thinking of, mm. you know, like fashing or fast, fast knocked or even a carnival to have sometimes that we really, uh, or even Halloween, that we really need this escape into this fantasy world in a dark time that your work really does give us in a strange way. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I hope it's a place that people can find some respite from kind of the 
turmoil and um, kind of grayness of a lot of our lives. You know, I really want to bring color and fantasy um, into the, you know, I, 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 it's kind of a joy to be able to create, um, create colorful spaces for um, people to enjoy in terms of the paintings. So um, pleasure, that's the word I was looking for. You know, when we did uh, meaning, one of the, one of our uh, goals was to talk about pleasure in painting and how painting was um, something, because at that time it was a very conceptual time and a very hard edged time. And um, Mira and I were very interested in bringing back the idea of pleasure to the discussion of painting. I would add the word enchantment when it, when it comes to your works too, because they're, uh, they're totally enchanting. And it's, it's sad, as I said, that we don't have a space for this anymore. This, this kind of enchanted world. I, I, that's, I think that really one of the, the, the wonderful things about these little treasures of AIR. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, our final question will be from Fong. Thank you, Anne and Noah. Thank you, Susan and Anne. Marvelous NSE today. And uh, I'm sorry I was in and out, but I can't wait to listen to the whole thing super soon. But I was there listening in uh, to, to notice there's several words that have been brought up. You know, <laughs> I love the idea of enchantment, and I think you are absolutely right about Susan's work. And I appreciate the taken back, claiming that space for narrative, for story. And it might have been unfashionable when you start doing it, no longer is. And the other thing, I, the other word I like also that John pointed out, psychological, the sublimation. And also brought to me the whole idea why mythology was created in the first place. Many things, it's, symbolizes whether it's created out of men's fear or created in order to measure time. I don't mean like clock light, you know, different kind of holding the space for time. And, but going back to enchantment, I, I also like to share with you, besides Susan Marvelous painting images, painting images of dragon, uh, Paolo Uccello, Beautiful painting. Eleanor, can you share to everyone here? Uh, the last time I was in London was four years ago, and I wanted to steal this painting from the museum so badly. <laughs> it's not that big, actually, but we talk about psychological sublimation and enchantment. As you remember, Uccello was so obsessed with perspective. Everything had to fit into that whole a uh, perspective of scheme, everything you can see that even the patchment of grass is formally into the vanishing point behind. Uh, but I just love, when I look at this painting there, I thought of Susan, just yeah. because. I totally agree. I mean, I, you know, I'm so inspired by this kind of depiction of dragons and it makes me want to run into the studio and start working on a version of this painting. <laughs> you know, I, I was literally thought of you just because of the portrayal of the dragon um, and the princess. As you, we all remember, the princess was supposed to be tied up under a tree um, or running away in great fear. That was exactly why George came and rescued her. But this portrait, it just so strain and so enchanting because she's actually walking her dragon she's taking her dragon for a walk <laughs> oh yeah and the dra the dragon's on a leash like exactly it's just and like saint martha she's always walking the dragon you know that's the point susan you know he <laughs> so and it's rough their affair you know and i think we this is enough we can go back eleanor thank you <laughs> I just want to make that association because that's exactly what your work is about, enchantment, you know? 
And when even when you reconstruct in your own painted imagery for each episode, you were able always brought bring that you know enchantment in. So last question is very simple. John already brought up color and flatness. And I noticed that's also the insistent use um, of black line, the outline, which kind of remind me, even though it's completely opposite of Leger, you know, which is so different. But I know that Leger, when he was here for his retrospective in the, the late 30, may have been 36, at MoMA, he was brought to the Morgan Library to see the, the Spanish aluminum manuscript by Mar Shapiro in the basement. Um, and that was very important to him because the flatness use of this incredible bright color band and the flatness use of it, and it affected him a great deal. Um, so I'm just asking, not to ask whether you have relationship with Leger, but just the fact that you use the black outline so precisely, so effectively. So can you talk more about that? Uh, I, I, am, I am, first of all, I'm a big Leger fan. Love, love, love um, his work. And uh, I, I remember as a child going to the Museum of Modern Art and I was like, always like totally taken by his work. Yeah. I, well, you know, but there's a lot of black outlines. It's partially because of the way I do my work in the sense that I tend to draw, make a drawing first. Then I tend to transfer the drawing to the canvas, which is a very linear thing. Yeah. And in order for me to kind of make my decisions about where I'm going to color things in, you can kind of see it in the painting behind me, is... Um, I tend to think sort of flatly like, okay, this is gonna be yellow, this is gonna be orange. And I think I almost put it together like a cubist sort of approach, yeah. you know, and um, it's, they're sort of constructed. The paintings are somewhat constructed, I would say. You could see it in the apocalypse, like the rocks are one solid mass. The people yeah. are, um, so I, I think it's because I'm kind of doing a drawing, going from a drawing and often from a drawing from a manuscript, right? Yeah. I'm using manuscript as my, as my template, then going to a drawing with colored pencil and then going to an oil painting. And so they are sort of constructions. And I think the black line actually serves to kind of, um, it's a guide, it's a guide for me. Plus I like, the linear in painting, you know, yes. I like, I like the idea of the linear in painting. I actually have tried to eliminate it sometimes mm -hmm. in my super early painting that's like behind my head. Um, you know, I don't really have too many black lines, but the shapes are very strong. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a way of asserting uh, a linear shape. Um, and I, I, I always look to see like how Matisse, how Picasso, not that I'm comparing myself to these people or Kandinsky use black lines, especially in their early work, you know? Yeah. And, and it's kind of a drawing tool, I think. I so. Think, yeah, it's a construction, you're absolutely right. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the Spanish monk, um, that manuscript, Illuminate manuscript that everybody can make appointment and see. They might not allow you to see the whole thing, but you can see it under the plexi down the basement. Um, it's called Beatus, twelfth century, uh, fifth century. Yeah. Anyway, that's that was the the book that I was thinking of. But thank you so much, Susan. That was lovely. Uh, looking forward to hear the whole thing. And now, back to you to hear Charles read it. Hello. Thank you, Fong. Thank you, Fong. That was thank you, Fong. Question. I'm so glad to have that we were able to make that connection. So thank you so much. Um, we are now going to move over to a poetry reading as per real tradition. And I'm thrilled to welcome Poet Laureate of the Day, Charles Bernstein, to the stage to conclude this afternoon. 
Charles Bernstein is the winner of the 2019 Bollingen Prize for Near Miss and for Lifetime Achievement in American Poetry. He is the author of Topsy Turvy and Pitch of Poetry, among others. And we're so grateful to have you here with us, Charles, and I'm thrilled to pass the mic over to you. It's a great to be here and great to learn about the work of Susan B. I want to find out more about that. So I'm going to go to the AIR show to see the work in person as soon as I can. Um, the first poem that I'm going to read is called Wheat and Chaff Rumba. South of Naples, north of desire, I lost my way in the middle of a choir. Blinds of clay, splints of wire, filaments of no degree, rumbling against fire, silly, something, seraphim, pickles with feijoada, graceless curtains, listless spires, incunabula bound in briars. Show me the baloney. I'll give you five to one. No percentage clamming up or quarreling all the liars. Slow motion, sudden moves, tipsy till the top, bottoms up, make believe, dance until you drop. And that poem is for Barbara Ancheski. Uh, this um, poem is called After Magret. This is not a sonnet. This is not a sonnet. This is not a line. Not a sentence. This is not a sentence. Not These words. are not words. These are not letters. This, this is, not. is not a poem. This, this is, is not art. This, this is, is not, not sound. sound. This is not thought. This is not, this is not visible. This is not, this is not conceivable. This, this is nonsense. This is false. false. This is not now. Is not now. This is not now. This is not now. This one is called Capitalism Gaslighted Me. Some of you may have this same problem, and it's one of my series of self-help poems. You're not alone. Capitalism gaslighted me. And so did Heidegger and Thomas Jefferson. God, too, if truth be told. The verdict is out on my parents, but it's not looking good. And I'm beginning to think, I'm gaslighting myself. Uh, this poem is for W.J.T. Mitchell, Twilight of the Gods, and it was written for the Brooklyn Rail feature that uh, Tom Mitchell edited uh, about a year ago. Um, and uh, on the subject of Twilight of the Gods, which is um, sort of salad days, the, the loss or the thinking about the the gods or the myths that were important to you in youth or the youth of the civilization as well. Twilight of the gods. Idols of summer gone, winter stays. Lost my love in a storm. Won't be back this way. Every day's twilight, life sits on the shelf next to cluster of bric-a-brac. Lysol cans, rumpled felt. Idols of salad days, utopias of youth, don't add up to a hill of beans or a ride on a glass bottom boat. Idols of time gone by, sting like those hissing green flies. Buzz over, buzz kill lingers on. Climate changes or maybe just catches up. Summer idols gone, winter doesn't 
stray, lost my love in a storm, won't be back this way. And uh, I'm going to end uh, with a poem, the only poem I'm going to read from Topsy Turvy. Beeline. Be in my bonnet stings all night long. Be in bonnet all night long. No sooner morning comes, begin to holler and bawl. One time I'm in the hen coop, next at the loading dock. Afraid I'll tumble down the stairs, then that I may not be in bonnet. Stings night and day, dozen flights of angels, not one who knows the way. I'm game if you are, see you on other side. God says he's hiding, hope to meet her for I die. Be in bonnet, stings me all night long. Dozen flights of angels, not one all take me home. Thanks. Thank you so much, Charles. That was amazing. And such a really perfect way to close out this beautiful conversation today. And thank you so much again to Susan and Anne for the really beautiful dialogue. We would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring the NSC program to make these daily conversations possible and for supporting our growing archive, which you can view on our YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the rail has provided a platform for arts, culture, and politics in our monthly publication and public events like our NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support our work. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Anthony Roth Costanzo and William Corwin on the event of Akhenaten, which is at the London Coliseum. We'll conclude tomorrow with a poetry reading by Peter Covino. And you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you all so much for joining us this <laughs> afternoon. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Congratulations on the show, Susan. Thank Can't you wait to show. see the show.